it's the same thing that needs to happen to reduce the emissions from fossil fuels. We have to have an across the board rising carbon price. That's, that way the market will help us um, get the optimum uh, means of re reducing the emissions and it would not be difficult then. Once you have uh, a price on carbon, those industries which will have to continue to emit at some rate could be allowed to substitute a reduction, an equal reduction, which they will have to purchase. And so that price on carbon will provide the incentive for developing the negative emissions. As soon as you look at negative emissions, you see it's not easy. That's what we're hearing today. It would be so much easier to reduce some of the emissions. There are no cost and, and even negative cost ways to reduce current emissions. So that's what we should be putting a lot of emphasis on. It's not that we, pr we probably will need negative emissions in the end, but the, we don't want the job to be so big that it's unsolvable. Oh, I think the first thing that needs to happen is focus on the co-benefits. So where we can reforest, um, that will store more carbon, it provides new habitat, where we can restore wetlands, uh, that again creates important habitat, and, and again will sequester the CO2. So the key there though is monitoring and, and getting data to verify the, uh, you know, the rates of uptake and so forth. So I think that's, that's stuff we can do right away. We don't even really need much of an incentive. Beyond that, there are things that are going to cost more today than the competing technologies for providing those services. Would, would cost, so we need to think about transitional incentives to get this going. Um, I think that BEX, for example, bioenergy plus CCS, we could start co-firing uh, biomass and, and, and solid fuels like coal and sequestering that. But again, that comes at a cost compared to just generating electricity and emitting to the atmosphere, so we need to think what kind of financial incentives will get that going. And there are many, many options for negative emissions, and I think we should think about those transitional incentives really across the board. Uh, we need to monitor, verify, document, uh, explain, uh, and, and, uh, and then as the carbon price rises, then those negative emissions opportunities, at some point there'll be a convergence on what it's cost and what the value is, and, uh, and then scale will happen. But we can't wait until that moment. We have to start now. Why we need it, I have here in my hands. Um, how we can do it and what needs to happen, this is a, a, a very broad question, which I would like to narrow down a little bit to um, my um, background and my field, which is uh, forestry and sustainability sciences. And I think it is uh, of utmost importance uh, that we on the scientific side understand that we have to come up with realistic solutions in terms of we need to show to the public but also to the policymakers that we can provide for instance sufficient feedstock in a sustainable way not only locally but regionally and globally enough in order to basically have a large share of the net needs um, coming from uh, sustainable forest management but also from sustainable agricultural management and for that we need uh, spatially explicit studies and we need to come up from my point of view with a scheme that can certify the sustainable origin of the feedstock if we think about bags. Um, the problem here is not uh, the combination of bioenergy and CCS, but the problem is to prove that whatever um, feedstock we need in order to create negative emissions, that this comes from sustainable origin. The critical step is to recognize that at the moment, the promise of negative emissions is a great justification for doing too little in reducing emissions today. And what's worse, that promise is one that may never be redeemed. For the system, 
there's no need for either mitigation or negative emissions. What they need is a promise of future action. And there's a real risk if we don't counter it, that not only will we see no inadequate mitigation, but also that negative emissions will not arise just to be replaced by another promise. And that's likely a promise of solar geoengineering. If we want to see negative emissions, then we probably need to put in place absolute regulatory mandates to impose on, for instance, fossil fuel producers, the need to capture, remove and store carbon dioxide. In the first step, I would say we have to take a step back and think about what are alternatives. This is very important to reflect about our own games and goals because um, I think if you want to bring backs down to earth, you have to have a broad societal commitment. You have to have a broad group of actors who support this kind of goal, vision and option. And when it comes, I'm trained as a social scientist, and when it comes to bring back down to earth, I think it's very important to scale down, but it's not only about upscaling, but it's also to take into account the societal context, because every technology, as we know from former emerging technologies, is embedded. It's not simply about technology, but it's also about the infrastructure in a material sense, but it's also about society who has to adopt this kind of technologies. So it's a broad societal change and therefore you need a lot of commitment of actors to these kind of technologies and embedded visions. And in countries like Germany we have the experience with nuclear power and we have the experience with fracking and a lot of Non-governmental organizations they are very resistant when it comes to these kind of technologies and we face this kind of um, resistance. But if you take a look at countries like Sweden, nuclear power or the storage of nuclear power waste was not a problem because um, it was embedded in a broad societal process where they enabled a, um, local actors to discuss this option. And this kind of well-designed process made it easier to implement technologies um, in, in local villages and so on. And I think we need this kind of broad societal process, political process, in a democratic, open and accountable way to implement these kind of solutions. So three things jump at my mind immediately. So one is if we look at the uh, literature on negative emission technologies and specifically at um, innovation stages, we see that a lot of the knowledge is concentrated in the very early stages, basically on R&D, but there's very little knowledge on the later stages, upscaling, um, demand pull, even public acceptance. So I think there is really a knowledge gap that we need to close in order to achieve the massive and quick uh, ramp up that we're looking at in the scenarios. Second thing is that we need a um, debate or discussion in society about the trade-offs um, and about the uh, side effects of um, large-scale deployment of negative emission technologies. Side effects, not only negative ones, but also positive ones in order to um, identify a feasible portfolio of negative emission technologies that would be able to minimize uh, risks to sustainability, for example, but also take advantage of opportunities. And uh, third, um, I think um, the whole discourse on negative emissions needs to also enter policy agendas rather than only discussing it conceptually, because right now what we're seeing is that incentives for large-scale deployment are missing. Um, not only for deployment, but even for demonstration partially. So this is something that we need to get our heads around. And I'm currently haven't been convinced yet that um, uh, what has been proposed using the CO2 and um, storing it in products will actually be able to achieve the scales that we're looking at um, when we look at the, uh, the 1.5 degree scenarios. I think what needs to happen is uh, that, that nation states, first of all, need to incentivize uh, research, development, demonstration and deployment into negative emissions technologies. They need to establish this as an explicit policy goal. 
Um, but what they need to do crucially is to um, do this in a responsible way. Um, and this means uh, involving members of the public in choosing which negative emissions technologies to incentivize in the first place. Uh, it means involving members of the public uh, in deciding how the technologies should be incentivized. Uh, so in terms of choosing different policy instruments. Uh, and thirdly, it means uh, involving the public in deciding how the technology should be governed uh, once they are incentivized or if they are incentivized um, at all. Um, research in this area has, has already started. Um, there's a lot more to be done. Um, so for example, around um, choosing which technologies to uh, incentivize in the first place, uh, we already know that things like afforestation uh, and biochar uh, are perceived quite positively by members of the public. Um, on the other hand, you've got things like ocean iron fertilization, which have been roundly condemned by uh, a number of studies. Um, so we can already see this kind of pattern starting to emerge there. Um, in terms of governance, um, there are a number of uh, principles that have started to emerge around uh, what would constitute uh, a sound way of governing the technologies as they come forward. Um, and then in terms of incentivization um, and the kind of policy instruments to do that, I think there needs to be a plurality of um, instruments used to attend to the kind of di divergent preferences um, that exist around these technologies. If we are really serious about the targets that we agreed on in Paris, so well below 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees, I think uh, we will need to bring them to scale. Um, and I think that will not happen overnight. Uh, so everything that at some point is at scale will, will start very small. And there are some forms of net negative emission technologies that are less controversial. And so they may, might provide a basis to start investing in. Uh, so for instance, the biochar option or uh, playing around a little bit with some of the more uh, uh, larger options, like for sure afforestation, uh, but in the long run, maybe also bioenergy and CCS. Uh, but uh, first doing this at a small scale and then uh, slowly see whether it works and then scaling up our ambitions will probably be the way to do, uh, which will be a learning process in terms of technologies it will certainly also be a learning process in, in terms of the governance that we need. Uh, but uh, let's allow us to take, uh, take the time to do, go through that learning curve.